Hello, good afternoon. Um, I want to thank um, uh, ISGF uh, for hosting and helping us organize uh, this Canada-India uh, mission today. Uh, this is our second uh, annual, and it's probably something we'd like to continue, a uh, workshop where we get uh, both Canadian uh, companies and utilities together with Indian companies and utilities uh, to talk about how we can collaborate uh, and use uh, you know, the knowledge that we have of both of our systems uh, to help each other. So uh, often, uh, you know, we hear about like the lessons learned from Canada, but whenever I find that I um, come to one of these international sessions, I learn something as well. Um, with that, uh, let me give you an overview of some of the smart grid activities that we've uh, had in Canada. Uh, my name is um, Alex Bancourt, like I said, and I'm the Managing Director of Smart Grid Canada. Uh, my main job, however, is I, uh, I I'm in charge of grid modernization for Hydro One, and Hydro One is like uh, the power grid of India. Uh, and so over the last you know, seven years, I've been involved in this project, uh, probably the biggest one in Canada, uh, modernizing our transmission and distribution grids. Uh, and we're happy to share that experience with you. Uh, and hopefully some of the um, experiences we have and the lessons learned that we've had uh, can help you guys in your implementation. Uh, so Smart Grid Canada is an industry association just like the ISGF. Uh, we have a mandate mostly to share information within Canada between utilities as well as internationally, and that's one of the reasons why we're here. Uh, and we're made up of mostly utilities. Uh, so most of the big utilities in Canada are members. Uh, we also have some major industrial players like Schneider Electric and GE, uh, and we involve uh, academia in our association as well. So that's sort of where all the knowledge base for this comes from. So what were the reasons that Canada started implementing a smart grid? The first one was, in general, there was a policy push towards green energy. Now, uh, in Joseph's presentation, he sort of showed you that Canadian generation comes largely from clean sources. Most of the energy in Canada, 70% of it, is carbon-free. Uh, you know, in provinces like Quebec and British Columbia, 97% of the power comes from hydro. We're very lucky to have hydro. Uh, but in Ontario, where I'm from, which is sort of like, it's like the national capital region, right? It's just like, you know, the area in and around Delhi sort of the biggest uh, province economically, uh, it's flat. There's no mountains. There's no opportunities for hydro. So most of the power comes from nuclear. Uh, what happened was, in the 2008 financial crisis, everybody was afraid that the auto industry was going to go into decline, and everybody was going to lose their jobs in the auto industry. And the government at the time looked at that and said, if we're going to lose all these jobs in the auto industry, we're going to need something to replace it. And they picked green energy. And so they came out with the Green Energy Act, and that drove uh, generous feed and tariffs for renewables, which drove a lot of renewable energy into the grid, which drove the need for smart grid. And so when we look back at what were the reasons why smart grid really started in Canada, it was around these policy objectives around driving renewables uh, and about job growth. Those were the primary reasons. <coughs> uh, so we talked about the growth in DGs because of those feed and tariffs. Uh, and the other thing is, in Canada, and it's the same in Canada, it's the same in the US, most of those assets got built in the 50s and the 60s, and they're old, right? They're at their full useful life. Uh, and uh, we are just starting a new wave of investment in the grid. Uh, I'd say over the 90s and the 2000s, not much capital work happened, right? Everything was built, it was largely about maintaining those assets. Uh, but now that we have a new, um, you know, mandate to integrate the renewables, and the fact that the transformers are now getting 40 or 50 or 60 years old, they need to be replaced. Uh, and the idea was, if we're going to spend the money replacing it anyways, why don't we spend a little extra money uh, and make it modern? And when I say modern, I mean remotely controllable, available to get all of the information from all the sensors that are online, the ability to do fault location, the ability to do rely reliability-centered maintenance. All of those activities gives us this opportunity because we're making those investments anyways. Uh, the other one is an aging workforce. Because we didn't build a good chunk of our grid between 1990 and 2010, we didn't hire anybody between 1990 and 2010. And this is true of a lot of utilities in North America. And so you have people who are either over the age of 50 or people who are under the age of 30 and nothing in between. I am right in the middle of that. And so for me, I, I find that you know, everybody's either 10 years older than me at least or five, 10 years younger than me. Uh, and so that knowledge, that institutional knowledge is going out the window. We really, you know, we, we've seen 
50% of the people in the utility are eligible to retire in five years. And I don't know how it is in India, but if you work for a utility in Canada, all those utilities are owned by the government, by the provincial governments, by the state governments, and it's a good pension, right? It's a pension you can live very well for the rest of your life, so there's no reason to keep on working. Uh, many of them do because they can't stop, but most of them are going to retire. And so when we lose that institutional knowledge, we need to take that institutional knowledge and put it into things like the DMS, right? People used to be able to reconfigure the network on the fly because they knew it because they've done it six times. That's no, that information will go when those people retire. Uh, and the last is customer engagement, right? We sell electricity. Everyone needs electricity. Uh, people have to pay for it. Uh, but our customers' expectations are changing. And because the utilities are owned by the state governments, it becomes a political issue, right? The state governments want uh, <coughs> uh, people to be happy with the utilities, and now utilities are having to focus on keeping their customers happy. And there's a lot of technology around smart grid uh, that we can use to um, uh, do that, as well as keep rates as flat as possible, right? Uh, it's, sort of it's, it's politically unpopular in Canada to increase the cost of electricity. It's politically unpopular anywhere to increase the cost of electricity, and I imagine it's a political issue here as well. So you'll see that our drivers aren't much different uh, across all of the assets, uh, across the different forces driving modernization. Uh, so when we look at, uh, one of the important things that we saw, especially for utilities when they're developing their smart grid strategy, is the government has a plan, right? The Indian government has a plan. The state governments here have a plan. And it's important to align your investments with that plan. And so this was a statement that came out of one of the uh, Ontario government's uh, report, right? So this is, this is what they really wanted to do. This was their vision. And when we started structuring our program, you know, we read these things, and this is just a short snippet, and we say, well, in order to do that, we need distribution automation. We need WiMAX as a communication technology. We need distribution management systems in order to be able to do this, right? We need de uh, our, an ability for the utilities to dispatch distributed generation, right? We need AMI. We need AMI, and we need to use those AMIs to improve our trouble operations. Uh, we need uh, demand response programs in order to be able to bring in the customers. And we're going to talk more about later that in session three. Um, and we need uh, the ability to dispatch those DGs. So when we look at all of that, that's how we developed our plan, right? This was our investment strategy. We said, here's the hundreds of millions of dollars we want to invest. It's on these things. It's aligned with the government policy. Regulator, please approve it. And we've been actually very successful in Ontario at applying to the regular for these smart grid investments, pointing to the government policy and saying, this is exactly what the government wants, and there's benefits associated with this for the customer, and they've approved those dollars. Um, one of the things that uh, Canadian utilities are scared of, and even U.S. utilities are scared of, and I'm not sure if you've heard this expression, there's something called the utility death spiral. And the utility death spiral happens this way, in that uh, as the cost of electricity goes up and as the cost of solar goes down, people are going to be incented to switch. It will be cheaper for them to produce power themselves than to buy it from the grid. Uh, which means that there'll be less people paying for the grid, and the grid doesn't change its cost. The grid, most of our investments are fixed, right? We think our investments are variable, and if you have a, uh, if most of your generation comes from fuel that you need to pay for, it's true, but even in the Indian grid, I would imagine that at least half are fixed cost. If nobody used a single kilowatt hour, the price would be the same. In Canada, where we have hydro plants and nuclear plants, it's 70% fixed, 80% fixed, right? There's very little fuel cost in the mix, which means that as you sell less kilowatt hours, the, pr the costs haven't gone away, the price per kilowatt hour has to go up. And so as those two things happen, you get the utility death spiral, which drives more people to solar as kilowatts go up. And so in the United States, Hawaii, California, is already past the point of grid parity, which means that it's cheaper to produce your own power than to buy it from the utility. In Ontario, we might hit that somewhere in 2020. That's only two, three years away. In Quebec, you'll never hit it. Quebec has the cheapest power in the world. Joseph pays seven cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, which is about six US cents, and they're very proud of themselves. Very proud. Uh, but Ontario, we don't have that. Uh, and so we ask people, are you gonna go off grid? Are you interested in going off grid? And you'll see, you know, in 2014, 
you know, we had 40% of the people, and it's growing. It's now 46%. And, you know, one thing that we did is, you know, ah, customers don't know what they're talking about. It's hard to make your own electricity, right? It's expensive, right? A microgrid in Canada, a battery, a solar, the inverters, the controllers, is going to cost $20,000. Nobody wants to spend $20,000. We told them, right? We asked them the question. We asked 2,000 people across the country every year. We asked them the question. We ask them question, are you interested in microgrid? Are you interested in going off-grid? And they say, yes, of course, because I hate my utility. And then we said, it's going to cost you $20,000. Are you still interested in going off-grid? And you want to know what? It only drops by 5 or 6%. So in people's minds, at least in Canada, and it'll be interesting to see if I in India this happens as well, is people have the idea that they can go off-grid, that they no longer need the utility, that solar will be their savior, and it's going to start happening without us, with us or without us. And so part of the things that uh, Canadian utilities are looking to do is they're looking to per be the platform that allows these microgrids to connect. Uh, sometime, um, like in Canada, you're not going to be able to make enough of your own power from solar alone. So unless you're using a backup diesel generator or a backup natural gas generator as your alternative source of, of generation, you're likely going to want to be connected to the grid. Uh, however, the utility, you know, the strategy that we're trying to develop right now is be that platform. Let them have microgrids, but let them also connect to the grid as an insurance policy and charge them on that basis, right? It's like, if you want to connect to the grid, it's $50 a month, no matter what. Uh, so those are the things that we've been thinking through. Um, we talked about why they're going off-grid. Uh, one other thing. Um, in Canada, there are different pricing regimes. You know, until very recently, maybe like five, six years ago, it was flat, right? Eight cents a kilowatt hour, 10 cents a kilowatt hour, use a thousand, it's a thousand times 10 cents. Uh, in Ontario, we've implemented smart meters everywhere. In Quebec, they've implemented smart meters everywhere. In Quebec, because they have cheap power and lots of hydro, there's no need to change the price of power based on hour of the day. They just want people to use less so they can sell their power to the United States and make money that way. In Ontario, when we make our power with nuclear power and natural gas and wind and solar, it's actually very expensive for us to serve power at the peak times. And so we've implemented a mandatory time of use pricing, which means that during peak times, people pay more for power. During off-peak times, people pay less for power. Um, and then we've been experimenting with the idea of critical peaks, which is, you know, on certain days of the year that we declare in advance, we say uh, the cost of power is going to go from 10 cents to 30 cents or 50 cents or 80 cents, really penalizing customers for using that type of power. Uh, and we ask customers, are you interested in these regimes? And we really thought that they wouldn't, but if you look at flat rate and time of use, they're both even Steven, right? So in your own markets in India, where you do have capacity problems, a lot of fossil generation, you could probably create a more efficient grid by having some of your customers switch from the flat rate structures that they have to time of use pricing. And that's what smart meters allow. It allows you to know what they used each hour of the day. Uh, we also ask customers, what are you interested in investing in? Uh, and, you know, the thing that, it's hard to, for you guys to read it, but the thing that comes up to the top of that list is solar power. 57% of people are interested in solar power. Uh, and so that's going to be coming down uh, the pipeline. And so in India, there are poor people and there are rich people, and those rich people will likely start installing solar on their buildings. Industry will likely start installing solar on their buildings uh, because at some point it will be cheaper than grid-based power. So I want to go over a case study of uh, the project that I'm involved in uh, for our s smart grid. We did a big pilot, about a $200 million pilot, called the Smart Zone Pilot, where we experimented with all of the smart grid uh, technologies that were available at the time. And we had these five objectives. Um, Alex, I also have to request you to pause the question. Five minutes, sure. Yeah. So, um, one of the things we did was we tried to explain this to regulators as best we can, and we did that by making a cartoon. This is an actual comic strip of Smart Grid, and there's five of these. Uh, and so if you're interested, let me know. These are publicly available. Uh, and uh, you know, if you're trying to explain this to somebody who's new to it, they can read the comic. And what we did was we started thinking about this when we implemented our smart meters. We were one of the first jurisdictions to implement smart meters. And so, um, we thought, you know, we can do automated meter ratings, but then we can move on to 
um, which is part of the smart grid project. But then we thought like for smart grid, we can do feeder analysis and SCADA using the same infrastructure. Uh, we can give ourselves uh, more information for the customers in the customer information system. Uh, we can start doing mobility uh, for customers. Uh, and all of these things require more and more data, more and more bandwidth. And so the way we provided that bandwidth is we built a utility-owned private WiMAX network. Now this is something that utilities uh, around the world are thinking about uh, because using third-party cellular, like you know, there's mobile phone providers in India, it's expensive. It's expensive for the utility to use machine-to-machine um, cellular plans for all of the SCADA devices and sensors they want to put on the grid. So we experiment with building our own, and we put it up in this own sound area, and you can see the propagation of the, of the radio networks to make sure, hey, with six towers, could we cover off this area? And there's about 100,000 customers in this area. So we put up those towers, and we put up WiMAX antennas, uh, and the government gave us uh, a bit of spectrum between 1.8 and 1.83 gigahertz just for utility operations, and they gave it to us for free which is a very useful thing. If, 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 and if there's regulators in the room or utilities in the room, it's useful for you to go to your own regulators and say, you know, electricity is a right for most people. We want to be able to provide the service better. Uh, if you give us the spectrum without us having to pay for it or pay the third-party cellular companies, we can reduce our cost and improve our service. The other thing that we did is we built a brand new uh, 61850 digital substation in an existing station. And so now we're getting fairly technical. But what this is is sort of like, it's the next generation substation. It's a digital substation. Treat everything before used to be electromechanical. It used to be like magnets and fuses. And then it moved digital, which meant they were all computers. But at, at the end of the day, they were computers that were networked with each other with like copper wires and milliamp signals. The digital substation treats all of the equipment as substations as computers on a network. A, like a LAN, just like any other computer. And there's lots of other things you can do about that. So we were the first big implementation of this in Canada, and, and one of the first in North America. Uh, and we also put all the distribution automation out there, fault location, things that we're looking to do. Overall, the business case for this is negative, right? It is hard to make a business case that says we're gonna improve reliability and integrate all the solar, and it's gonna make the uh, cost uh, less for the customer. However, there's quite a lot of societal benefits associated with improved reliability, and the way we valued that was through this model. So this is a model developed by the Berkeley National Laboratories in the US, and it's been used by lots of utilities, and it says that when you and I experience an outage at home, it's not that, it doesn't cost us that much. It costs us two bucks, right? That's the inconvenience of having a power outage. But if you are a medium-sized company or a big, large company, it costs a lot more. And so what utilities do is they say, well, here's the profile of all of our customers by count. This is the outages they experience. And you can come to like a dollar figure per customer minute interrupted, which is the metric we use, that you use to value your investments. So if you're able to make a $10,000 investment and it saves customer $30,000 in minute interruptions, that's a way to validate to the regulator. The other thing they've said is that not all, uh, not all benefits can be quantified. So I was speaking with a colleague over at Reliance and they're trying to make their business case for smart meter investments and some of those things aren't going to be financial benefits that come off the bottom line. Some of them are societal goods or some of them are just hard to quantify. Uh, however, sometimes you just need to make a leap of faith that these benefits exist. Uh, and in general, the whole overall long-term opportunity is we can optimize our grid by having the levers on each of these things that are coming our way. Having a lever over the renewables, having a lever over storage, having a lever over EV allows us to make a grid that's far more cost-effective, efficient, reliable uh, than it has before. And although all these things are new things on the grid, having some universal control through a distribution management system uh, allows us to um, provide a better grid at about the same cost as it is today. And with that, I'll say thank you and I'll take a couple questions. Any questions for Alex? Yes. Oh, you're always there. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, <coughs> myself, Anand. I represent a consultant company, actually. Uh, my question is that you spoke a word regarding a digital substation. Yes. 
So what is the exact uh, principles you are using? You are trying to replace an uh, analog meter or you are just trying to connect an analog and a digital meter? So, how so, so this, is, th this is substation, protection and control. Yeah. So this is relays, theater protections, bus protections, transmission protections. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was taking the old electromechanical relays and replacing them with this new standard of relays that where the relays act as computers on a computer network as opposed to being one-off point-to-point uh, -point connections. Every relay is connected to the relay, and so they communicate with each other. And what that allows you to do is it really reduces the cost of the substation by 25% because you need less pieces of equipment, less drafting, less space, less stuff. Uh, and the other thing is you can commission it before it gets there. You put it in a trailer. If they're all just computers, you pre-test it. You ship it to site. You put it on some concrete. You plug in the network cables at the end, and then you're done. Oh, over here. Yeah, we're having so many questions. But I'm sorry, we're going to only take two. Yeah. Because we're running out take of one time. I'll take yeah. one, one question here. It's really, so, so one is, I think there's, sort of, there's a freedom ethic. They're like, I hate my utility. They give me a power bill every month. I just want to be free of them. Uh, there's a self-sufficiency exit. I want to be self-sufficient. They don't equate, most power in uh, Canada is clean, right? It really is, right? If you're in Quebec or BC, right, it's hydro. It's not making any carbon. Uh, but people still perceive that solar power is cleaner than that hydro or it's cleaner than that nuclear. And so, and then the other one is going to be cost, right? Some people have very high power bills uh, and they think that if they create their own power, it will make it cheaper for them, okay? Uh, so with that, I'll close uh, session one, uh, and we'll move on to... Uh, yeah, before we close on, I think uh, this, I'm sorry, but Alex, you have to answer one more question. I <laughs> promise one oh, more. Oh, sure. So this gentleman here. So why don't you introduce yourself and then ask the question. constraint of uh, putting an additional transmission system of higher voltage, the small hydroelectric projects which have come up in that area, one or two were earlier evacuating the power from that area. But now, when other another uh, small hydroelectric projects which have come up, there is a, since there is a very small load available for the local distribution, and during the daytime, they are able to evacuate to meet the local requirement and evacuate the power. But during the night time, the voltage goes very high. And the uh, load, it is become very difficult to evacuate the power from that area. So is there any so smart grid solution for that? So, so just, just so I understand, um, that local community is mostly powered by that small hydro. Does the small hydro have reservoir capability? Can it keep hold water? No. It's a run of river hydro? Uh, Alex, Alex, and I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt here. Maybe you can take this question offline. Sure. That would be good because I think it's a very interesting discussion that we, you'll have. And you know, we, we are running out of session time, so 